that better? Yeah. Now y'all can hear me, huh? Well, y'all wouldn't be the ones having a hard time hearing me anyway. Go ahead and be finding um, 2 Kings uh, chapter 2. We're going to finish up chapter 2 tonight. Uh, We'll be looking at verses 23 through 25. Um, And a pretty tough story, which we'll uh, talk about a little bit more um, as we get into into this. Um, We started our study of Elijah several weeks ago, and, and I've been you know, different ways of kind of trying to introduce him. Let me just kind of, as we get started tonight, give you uh, that reminder of just some background information about him. Um, We'll run through these pretty quick. You guys probably can go ahead and fill it in. I've given given it to you so much, but just kind of reminder um, of Elisha. I think one of the reasons that I I really like to do this review as it kind of gets it in my head. So kind of helps me kind of remember it. And also I think it distinguishes a little bit between these two prophets that we often get confused, um, Elijah and Elisha. And um, their lives so intertwine, um, and we'll, as we'll see tonight, um, even in, in the passage we're going to look at, um, that I think sometimes when you're studying about one, the overlap of their lives can get to be quite confusing. So remember we said that the name Elisha means God is salvation, um, and it kind of gives us an idea of his purpose and his ministry. Um, we had a last week, remember we did that uh, true or false quiz, which was kind of fun. Um, Elijah's name means... Um, God is Jehovah. Jehovah is God. Um, And that was his purpose. Remember, he came into the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, and and they had begun, they had left God and had begun to worship Baal, a false god. And so God called the prophet Elijah to come in and reestablish the fact that there's only one God and Jehovah is God. And his name kind of backed that up. Now that Elijah Elijah has gone and turned, turned the mantle over to Elisha, Elisha now is coming in to preach salvation to the nation of Israel. Uh, so they know who the true God is now. Now he's going to bring them the message that, that God is your salvation. Um, so we'll see that pretty clearly. Remember that uh, Elisha was the son of a farmer named Shaphat, Shaphat and was himself a farmer when God called him. That's significant. Um, it's interesting to me when God calls us that um, he calls us out of certain things where he has developed us to where we are when he calls us. He's given us gifts. He's given us a mindset, a personality where he can use us for his purposes. And I think uh, a lot of that has to do with Elijah. Um, if, he is, if his name means God is salvation, remember God's going to use him to plant seeds, to plant the seed of salvation in the hearts of men and women throughout Israel. So that's significant. Elisha was from the town of Abel, Mahola in Israel, uh, which means meadow of dancing, uh, which many people think that reflects something of his personality. Uh, Elisha was more of a joyful person, uh, a person that's life was kind of filled with uh, compassion and, and joy and some of those lighter gifts. Um, that's significant and very significant given the story we're going to look at tonight. Um, that'll be a little bit unnerving for many of us. Okay. Um, number four is an important one. Elisha's call to the ministry was from God, not from man and was issued through the prophet Elijah. Many people get that mistaken because, um, it seems like Elijah trained Elisha for ministry and then passed his mantle on to him as if he's, it's like, Elijah called him, but we know that's not true from scripture. Uh, God told Elijah to go and anoint Elisha as his prophet. And so uh, he was called of God, not man. And then number five, um, we talked about um, when God called Elijah, he surrendered his life fully to his call. And that's important because the way the story reads, it can sound like, let me first go and tell my parents goodbye And the whole story can sound like he was reluctant to go. He wasn't. Remember, he went and told his parents goodbye, and then he burned his equipment and sacrificed his animals, kind of showing that he wasn't going to return, that he was fully surrendered. So those kind of things kind of set uh, the stage a little bit for us. And I think that background is going to be really important in the story we're going to look at tonight uh, to kind of have those things kind of firmly um, established in your mind. Um, remember um, what what was Elijah's uh, ministry most known for? What 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 kind of prophet was he? Have we been saying? 
That's right. He was the prophet of miracles, okay? And, and that's what he was most known for. Remember, we've been saying that no one in Scripture, recorded Scripture that we have, performed more miracles than Elisha except Moses, okay? And we've said that over and over again. Um, even Jesus himself um, didn't perform as many miracles as Elisha did. And there's some significance to that, um, as we're going to kind of see tonight. Um, but I thought this would be kind of interesting for you guys to see. Uh, I'm going to work through this uh, and give you the 17 miracles of Elisha. Um, there's some other things beside these 17 that some people classify as miracles too. Uh, sometimes you can get that list up to 28 or 30 miracles. These are the 17 that kind of stand out in scripture uh, that most people kind of list as the 17 miracles of Elisha. Um, and, and then, so I'm going to give these to you. You can kind of fill in the blanks there if you want to. And then I'm going to give you some kind of interesting things as you kind of look at it there on your page um, about these miracles. So let me just run through them um, and, and you can fill these in as we go. Uh, and I've also given you there the scripture reference for where those miracles take place. Um, I'll also kind of stop on the one we're going to be focused on tonight. Um, so let me just run through them really quickly. Number one, the parting of the waters of the Jordan River. We've already seen that one. Remember that happened uh, at, Elisha's, at Elijah's translation. Uh, and then, uh, you know, when he ascended to heaven and then um, the mantle fell to Elijah and he struck the waters and they parted. The second one there is the purification of the water at Jericho. That's the one we saw last week. Uh, remember at Jericho, the water was bad um, and, and Elisha healed the water. Okay. Number three um, is the story we're going to be in tonight. That's a very troubling story. The protection of the prophet by two female bears. So that's why you saw that really aggressive background for us tonight with that bear growling. Okay. Um, so the protection of the prophet by two female bears. We're going to be in that passage tonight. Number four is water being miraculously supplied to the army of Israel. Um, we'll see that one. Uh, number five is providing the widow's oil. Okay. And rather than running through these, I'm putting them all up there so y'all can see them on the screen and, and kind of fill, them in, fill in if you want to. Um, number six is the barren Shumanite woman conceives a child. Uh, Elijah, through Elisha, God causes her to conceive a child. Um, and then number seven, the resurrection of the son of the Shumanite woman uh, raised from the dead, which is very interesting. Elijah had a resurrection miracle. Elijah had a resurrection miracle, which both point to Jesus, who had a resurrection miracle. Not only his, but he raised Lazarus, remember? Okay. Uh, number seven, uh, purifying the poison soup. That was one of our true and false questions last week that some of you went. Uh, did that happen? <laughs> yes, he did. He purified the poison soup. Uh, number nine is the multiplication of the loaves of bread. Number 10 should be a familiar story to the healing of Naaman's leprosy. Uh, remember, Naaman was the officer that had leprosy and Elijah, Elijah, Elisha healed him. And then number 11 is Elisha's servant Gehazi is cursed with leprosy. He gets leprosy as a curse. Number 12 is a favorite Bible story for lots of folk. It, folks. It's the miracle of the floating axe head. Uh, we know that iron don't float. It sinks, right? But through Elisha, God caused um, an iron axe head to float. Number 13, a servant sees a massive angelic army and chariots. That's an amazing story. They're surrounded by the armies of Aram and Eli they're going to kill Elisha. And Elisha's not in a panic, but the servant is. And he doesn't under So Elisha prays for the servant's eyes to be open. And he sees the armies of the Lord surrounding the armies of Aram. That's a very powerful story. Um, and then uh, number 14, uh, the Syrian army or the army of Aram is struck blind. And then um, Elisha and Gehazi lead them uh, right straight dab into the heart of Samaria. And then this next one, uh, number 17, the Syrian army's eyes sight is restored. Um, so he leads them blind into captivity. And right there in the middle, he opens their eyes and, 
It's a great story. He's, he's actually, God shows his mercy to them, which is a powerful thing. Uh, number 17, the trampling death of the king's officer. Uh, some of you might remember that miracle. Uh, they're shut up inside of Samaria, surrounded by enemy armies, and they're starving to death. And God gives them what they need, but the king's officer says it would take years and years to build a food supply. And Elisha says, this time tomorrow, I will perform this, but you will never see it. And he's trampled to death as the people run to get the food. <laughs> so it's a, quite a story. And then number 17, a dead man comes to life. And that's because they throw his body on top of Elisha's bones and he resurrects. Um, those are the 17 miracles of Elisha. Now, again, um, if you read all of the passages in, in 2 Kings that contain the story of Elisha, you'll see some other things that you'll go, oh, that was a miracle, and that was a miracle, and that was a miracle. These are the 17 key miracles that people kind of pick up on, but you can find some others. Now, um, I want to kind of point out some things to you that are very interesting about um, Elisha's miracles. Every miracle that Jesus performed had a reason. Some people go, well, if Jesus could perform miracles or if Elijah through God could perform, why didn't they just heal everybody? Why didn't they just, because miracles are always performed for a set purpose, for, for a reason. And, and usually it's to point to God, to affirm who he is. Um, you know, how, how we knew Jesus was God through his miracles. So, so that's a part of that. But there's some important takeaways that we need to make note of in Elisha's miracles uh, that kind of set these apart. And I wanted you to be able to look at that list while we're kind of pointing these things out um, so that you can see it. Um, for example, number one, these are the three important takeaways here. Number one, the first three miracles were miracles specifically to validate and confirm Elisha's call from God. Now look at the first three miracles. We've already seen two of them and we're going to see the third one tonight. But these first three miracles of Elisha were to validate and confirm Elisha's call from God. Okay. And that was the parting of the Jordan River. And if you remember that happened when the mantle fell on him and he's on the wrong side and he strikes it with the mantle, it parts. And remember the prophets uh, of Israel see that and now they know that the power of God on Elijah has passed to Elisha. So it's validating and confirming Elisha's ministry. The second one was the purification of the water at Jericho. Um, remember, we looked at that last week. That was very significant and was a confirmation. And it even says so in the passage in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 18 through 22, that they said, now we know that you are God's prophet that he has sent. Uh, to bring healing to Israel, okay? So um, that's the second one. The third one um, is the one we're going to look at tonight, the protection of the prophet by the two female bears. Um, we'll get more into this in just a little bit, but it's the third one, and it's what we're going to see tonight in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, um, and you'll see why this is an interesting miracle um, in and of itself. So those, those first three miracles of Elijah, their set purpose was to validate and confirm to the people of Israel and also to the prophets of Israel that God's power rested on Elisha and he was the prophet of the true God, okay? Um, the second thing you need to see is that, and, I, and I'm using the word almost, um, almost all of Elijah's miracles are called miracles of grace. And that's a very interesting phrase, okay? They're, they're called miracles of grace, um, almost all of his miracles. Uh, there's 17 of them. Um, and that's significant. Now, let's think just back for a second. And, and I wanted to give you that background stuff tonight so you could kind of see this. What does the name Elisha mean again? God is salvation. And we know that we are saved by grace, right? Um, but, but grace is an interesting concept even for Israel. Because in the Old Testament, remember, they had the law. And it was very easy to get confused. Oh, we must do these things in order to be saved. But you'll hear me preach and many preachers preach today. And we say this all the time. In the Old Testament, they were saved the same way we are in the New Testament. They were saved by grace through faith. They weren't saved by sacrifice. Okay. Uh, that they weren't saved by keeping the law. That's not what it, the law was to point to our need for God. 
The law was given in order that it might show our corruption and our need for God. So that's very significant. So Elisha really is the prophet um, who is going to, the prophet of miracles and, and, and their grace miracles to show God's grace, that he is a gracious God. And almost all of these miracles fit into that, even though some of them seem hard, okay? Uh, they all point to grace. And, and even the ones that don't, uh, really point to grace in a, in a subtle way. And that's kind of the third, third kind of important takeaway. Um, I said almost all, of, all the miracles. So number three, there are three miracles that are an exception to the miracles of grace and are rather called miracles of judgment, okay? But important to note here that in every case, the judgment is a direct outcome of the sliding of God's grace, you hear what I'm saying? So they're miracles of grace, but there's these three miracles that they call miracles of judgment, but they're miracles of judgment because of the sliding of God's grace, which was the most important message that Elijah had to share. So that's really significant. Now, what we know is that God takes it very seriously when we get in the way of somebody being saved. You can think about it that way. That, that that's very serious to God. If we stand in the way of someone coming to him, right, that's a very serious affront. Um, why did Jesus cleanse the temple? Why did he turn over tables and run the money changers out? Why did that happen? That was a very violent act. Why did it happen? They were getting in the way of people getting to God, Okay. Because in the, in the Gentile court where they had set that up was the only place that the poor and Gentiles and women were allowed to worship. And they couldn't worship and they couldn't come to God because of the money changers. So Jesus drove them out. You see, God takes it very seriously when anyone gets in the way of his message of grace to other people to draw them to himself. So keep that in your mind because it may help you understand tonight's story. Um, it's important that we kind of think about that because um, the story tonight a, is a hard one. Um, matter of fact, I've, I've struggled with this. I've been working on this one now for almost two weeks. Uh, even so you're like, if, you, if he's been doing this two weeks, we'll never get through this tonight, right? <laughs> and that's likely, that's likely, but we're going to try. Okay, so um, we're going to look at the first of these three miracles, but I want you to look at your miracle list there so I can point out the three miracles of judgment. Number one, the first miracle of judgment is the third miracle there that we're going to look at tonight, the protection of the prophet by the two female bears. What was that about? It was a miraculous thing that happened, um, but it's a hard one for us to get our head around which you'll see when we get into tonight, but that's one of them. The second miracle of judgment was the 11th one that I gave you when Elijah's servant Gehazi gets cursed with leprosy. So if you remember that story, um, through, through Elisha, God healed Naaman of his leprosy. And Naaman came back to Elisha and wanted to reward him with material wealth, with material gifts. He wanted to give those to him. And Elisha refused to take them. And the reason he did that is because Elijah knew, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the one who's doing these miracles. God is. And, and I'm not going to take a penny from you because God has graced you and has brought healing to your body in order that you can see that he is the true God. Well, when Elisha heard that there was money involved, he went chasing after Naaman and took gifts from Naaman for the for, for, for the healing that had happened uh, to, and, and Naaman cursed him. I mean, I, I'm sorry. And Elisha cursed him and said, said, said the disease that had plagued Naaman will now plague you and your family. And that's how Gehazi ended up with leprosy. We'll see that story as we get more into his life, but that's one of the miracles of judgment, okay? And once again, it's because Gehazi got in the, in the way of the grace of God. Uh, the picture of the grace of God. The, the um, third miracle that's considered a miracle of judgment is the 16th one, the trampling death of the king's officer. Um, and we'll get into that story more as we kind of get towards the end of his life. Um, but particularly, this particular officer was discouraging the people of Israel from following God and what he had provided for them as a miracle of grace. 
Um, so uh, we'll see that. So just want you to see, that's an interesting take on his miracles as you kind of put them in context and you begin to see, you know, miracles in scripture always have a purpose. There's a message in them. There's, there's something that God is showing us. It's, they're not just random shots in the dark. That's why we can't say, you know, if Jesus was so miraculous, why didn't he heal everybody? Well, because his miracles had a set purpose. They had a, they had a direct meaning, okay? Um, and that's the same with the prophets, okay? So tonight, we're going to be looking at the first of those exception miracles, the ones that we call miracles of judgment. And, and I don't want us to miss this. So uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read the passage. If you've got your Bible there uh, in 2 Kings chapter 2, I want to look at verses 23 through 25. Now, here's what I need to preface it with. We'll talk about it a little bit. Then I'm going to ask you some questions to kind of get in your mind what's happening here. Uh, just want to preface it with some of these statements. This is one of the most troubling passages for many people in all of Scripture if they know the story. Uh, there's many people that go, were there actually two female bears that killed a bunch of children in scripture? Well, yes, that is the story. And we're going to explain the story and kind of get more into it tonight so we understand exactly what happened there. Um, if you listen to the secular world some and their attacks on the Bible, their attacks on Christianity, you will hear them say things like, I could never serve the wrathful, vengeful God of Christianity. If God is real, I don't want anything to do with him because he's so vengeful. And this is one of the stories they'll point to. Um, the killing of um, what they say, the children, the killing of 42 children by the two female bears. Uh, this miracle is the one, and it's very disturbing. So I'm just telling you that, so you'll hear this story, and, and I'm just telling you, when you read this story, and when we read this story, the initial reaction that we have is go, oh, this is bad. How do I explain this to a lost world? How do I, how, how do I get my head around this? This this doesn't sound good, okay? So look at your Bible there, 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning in verse 23. Here's what happened. Now remember, and I'll show you the map here in a minute, um, Elijah is, is re-stepping all that, those places he had been with Elijah before Elijah ascended. Now he's going back to all those places, and we'll see it here on the map in a minute. So verse 23, then he, Elisha, went up from there to Bethel, and as he was going up the road, some youths came from the city and mocked him and said to him, go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head. So he turned around and looked at them and pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And two female bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. Then he went from there to Mount Carmel and from there he returned to Samaria. Troubling, right? troubling passage when you read it. You go, yep, there's some humor in it, right? It sounds petty, right? You go, okay, so the picture I'm getting is they called him names, he got mad, cursed them, and said, God, get them, and he sicked his bears on them, right? That's the way we read it, and, and, and it disturbs us when we read it, and, and that's the way the world reads it, okay? Um, there's a lot more in that passage that's happening. It, and, and the other thing about this little passage, it's only three verses. It's mentioned so quick and bypassed. It's almost like, eh, come see, come say, right? No big deal. He pronounces the curse, the bears eat him up, and then he proceeds on his way <laughs> to Mount Carmel, okay? And we read it and we just go, there's something about this story that bothers me. And I'm just going to be honest with you, even for some Christians, this story's hard, um, most people, when you're teaching through Second Kings or maybe in a Sunday school class, come to a passage like this and just go, I'd rather skip this one. You know, I'd, I'd rather just not have to dig into this one because it doesn't have any. And here's, here's what I think about that. Um, and this is just me. I don't think we ought to ever hide from Scripture. I, I think we need to dig into Scripture. And one of the things I've told you all over and over on Wednesday nights when we've done our studies on how we got God's word, on the principles of hermeneutics or interpretation of the Bible, things like that. Um, I've told you that one of the things you need to remember is scripture never contradicts itself, okay? So when you read a troubling passage like this that you go, 
this doesn't seem consistent with the God that I see revealed in Scripture. Okay, then you need to dig deeper. You need to understand what's going on here, what's happening here, okay? And so that's what I want to do tonight is really get into this um, a little bit more. Now, um, Sarah, can you put that map up for us so um, I can kind of show you this? I've gone ahead and traced on here uh, some of um, Elisha's steps now. Um, if you'll remember, um, there are several places that when Elijah, Elijah took, took up and began to follow Elijah, that you remember in, in, the, in that second chapter towards the very beginning of that chapter, Elijah begins to make his trek down towards Elijah Hill where he will ascend into heaven, where there will be this translation of Elijah in the whirlwind. Remember that. And remember he would go from place to place and everywhere he went, Elijah would say to Elijah, Elisha, you stay here, I'm going to the next town. And everywhere there were prophets who would say to Elisha, do you know that your, 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 um, the man that you're following is, is about to leave you. And Elijah would say to them, be quiet, I know. Remember the story, y'all remember that because we, we studied that when we finished Elijah's life. Well, now what you're going to see is that um, the mantle has fallen from Elijah to Elisha on Elijah Hill and, and he strikes the water because he's on the wrong side of the Jordan and he goes across the Jordan and he begins a track trek back through those same towns, okay? He's headed back through those same places. Last week, we trekked with him to Jericho, which was the last town he went to before he crossed over the Jordan, parted it, Elijah did, and ascended, okay? So last week, he was at Jericho. The place he was at before that was Gilgal. He went to Gilgal, and now he's headed up back from Jericho to to Bethel, which was one of the places that um, Elijah, Elijah had taken him, okay? And so he's trekking, he's, he's going back up to Bethel, you can see that, and it's there at Bethel where this incident takes place, okay? We see that in the passage that we just read. From there, he's going to go all the way back up to Mount Carmel, which is going to be very significant for a reason. We'll see that Tonight, I think a little bit, I'll point it out to you probably quickly as we rush by that. And then from there, he's going to come back down to Samaria, which at that time was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. Okay, so you just kind of need to see that trek where he's headed. But this incident, and I put the two bare faces on there so you know, this kind of happens right there around Bethel um, where he was headed uh, in this. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask some questions that I want us just to talk about. And the reason I'm asking these questions is because I want to get some things firmly in your mind. I want you to think deeply about these, okay, uh, for, just, for just a second. And, and, and let's just talk about this because I think you need this kind of, kind of foundation uh, with these questions uh, in order for you to begin to get your head around what happens in verses 23 through 25. Even though it's three short verses, it's a troubling verse, uh, passage. It's a troubling passage for us. It's a troubling passage for us to communicate to a world that doesn't understand this. Sometimes we don't understand it. And so we got to get our heads around some things. So, so here's the, first of all, here's the first thing I want you to think about. Um, how important really is the holiness of God? Think about that. How important is it, really, the holiness of God? And do we see evidences of how important the holiness of God is in Scripture? Do we see some examples in Scripture of how God relates to us as a holy God and the picture in Scripture of how He wants us to see Him as holy? Think about that for just a second because it's important foundation when you start reading a story like this. How serious should we take the holiness of God of God. How serious does God take his holiness? Now let's talk about that for a second. We, we give, we kind of give lip service to the fact that God is holy, right? But what does that really mean? What, what does it really, what, you know, how serious should we take it? How serious does God take it? Think about holiness for a second and what we see in scripture that maybe we overlook. What do y'all think? Mm hmm. Uh, very important. Okay. Yeah. Reverence. Respect. Yeah. Good. What does it mean that God is holy? Without sin. 
okay? That he's without sin, perfect. You think of anything in scripture that points to how holy God is? Yes, yeah, Sarah? God tells him to take his shoes off because he's on holy ground. Yeah. That's a good picture of it. And it's a very serious picture, isn't it? Remember that um, the, children, the children of Israel that Moses had led from Egypt are down below that mountain watching the fire of God, holy God, burn, and they're terrified, right? Yeah, it's like a holy fear of reverence of him. Can you think of other examples in scripture? John, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Okay. And uh, you know, like we know that Elijah and, and Elisha were referred to as a man of God. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking back to that widow when Elijah brought her son back to life, and she said, "I now perceive that thou art a man of God, and what you say is the truth." Mm -hmm. so Yeah. Do you remember another story? Go ahead, Cinder. I was just thinking about that could have a purpose for the bears killing the children because Elijah was a man of God and they were in effect making fun of all his life. Okay. I, want you, I just want y'all to think about this because scripture gives us this picture that we overlook because it makes us uncomfortable. Remember the story of them returning the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant. Remember them returning and one of those carrying it, their priest, they reach out and touch the Ark and God kills them immediately. And we go, what, well, what's that about? Remember the story of how the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies where God's presence was only once a year on behalf of the people and it's true, they tied a rope around his ankle and his robe had bells on the bottom. And as long as they could hear the bells, they would know that God didn't kill him in his holiness. If the bells ever stopped ringing, they'd pull him out by the rope. And that sounds funny to us, but it's because they recognize God is holy. Whenever the children of Israel were wandering around in the wilderness and they had the tabernacle, remember when they had the tabernacle? And, and the glory of God, holy God would come down into the tabernacle and Moses would go to meet him. And here's what the Bible says in the book of Exodus. All the children of Israel would go and stand outside of their, outside of their tent and watch the tabernacle, the holiness of God come down. But they would not go to the tabernacle because they feared holy God. There was a reverence for that. 
That's a pretty powerful picture. And all through scripture, we see that, okay? There's a significance when Jesus dies on the cross and the veil of the temple is torn in two, okay? And, and from the top to the bottom, signifying that God did that. And that was to the holiest of holies where God dwelt. And what was Jesus doing on the cross, but giving us access to holy God only through the blood of Jesus, if we're not saved, we can't come into the presence of a holy God, period. We're still sinners. If it wasn't for Jesus, we couldn't get there. And we need to see that. That's very significant in Scripture. And here's what I think today, that sometimes today we have lost that holy fear of God. God is holy. And, and sometimes I wonder how long is he going to put up with our unholiness, even in the treatment of him, I think we've become far less reverent in our worship of him, uh, far less reverent in how we approach him sometimes. We forget about his holiness. And I'm glad you pointed that out because that's a part of the foundation for this story is to understand the holiness of God, okay? That's gonna help you. Now, here's the second question. Yeah, we're not gonna get through tonight. Do we really understand and take God's sovereignty seriously? What does the sovereignty of God mean? Do we really understand and take the sovereignty of God? We've talked about his holiness. Now, these are foundational things to understand this story. I'm just telling you, there's three verses here, and this is one of the most complex, hard to reach stories in scripture that most people balk at, and they don't want to study it. But if you don't understand the holiness of God and the sovereignty of God, you will never get the story. Okay, you'll walk away from your scratching your head and going, that's just not fair. That's just not right. That shouldn't happen. Okay, so what do we mean when we talk about the sovereignty of God? What does it mean that God is sovereign? Mm -hmm. What's a sovereign? You know, my little English lady, what is the sovereign? A what? Okay. The head of everything, okay? So we talk about God being sovereign. There is no one over him, okay? When God is sovereign, he can do as he pleases, okay? That's why in Romans, Paul says, who, who are we to say to God, why did you make me thus? How can we say to the potter, why did you make me like this pot? We have no power at all to question what God does, okay? So that's important in understanding this story too. It bothers us that these two bears came out and killed these kids. And yes, it should bother us because it sounds terrible and we're human and we understand that just sounds awful. I can't imagine being mauled by two female bears. First of all, I'm just going to tell you, don't mess with two females, period, right? They will maul you, <laughs> Be careful, right? But the, just that, that aside, just, I mean, it's, the story sounds terrible, but listen, ultimately, God knows, right? That's what it means to be sovereign. And God can do as he pleases. He made us and he can do with us as he wants. And, and that's a difficult place for us to get to to understand. But understanding the foundation of his holiness and his sovereignty kind of helps us to understand that. Now, here's the third thing I want you to think about. Does God protect, sustain, empower, and provide for those he calls? Yes, he does. That's important to this story. And here's the fourth one. What do you think about the statement that God says in his, that, that says that his word will not return void? What do you think about that statement? It always accomplishes what he sent it to do. Yes. So when God calls someone and he gives them a message and a plan and a purpose, there is nothing that's going to stop that. You need to understand that. God's purposes and his plans will move forward, okay? And there's nothing that's going to impede or stop that from happening. And I believe that to be true. That's why I think today when people make comments like, um, well, they're, they're going to destroy Christianity and they're going to destroy the church and they're going to, you know, do away with the Bible and they're going to shut down all the preachers. That ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. Now, we could lose some of our freedoms and our rights, but look what happens in countries where that's happened. What happens? 
You know how many hundreds of thousands of millions of believers are now in places like Iran and Iraq and China and places like that where it's illegal, where they've tried to shut down all the churches and take the Bible away? You know what's happened in those countries? Christianity has flourished and, and God's message will not return void. I'm just telling you, they can try a hundred million times and will not be able to shut down the church or Christianity it will not go away. It's God's plan. And nothing's going to stand in the way of that, even if he has to send two female bears to take care of matters, right? Huh? Only sent two. And they got 42 of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Y'all, I know I'm making light there of that. It's, we shouldn't make light of it because it's pretty bad. So here's what I've st- titled this study tonight because there's three, p- three, three key parts to this study, really. Bethel, bad boys, and bears. Okay, that's the three parts to this story. Bethel, bad boys, and bears. It sound, kind of sounds like a children's book, doesn't it? Like the three bears or something. <laughs> but but I, want you, I want you just to think about this um, a little bit. There's way more in here that I could share. I want us to look at this, and, and I'm just going to pick it apart in the time that we have left and see if we can't kind of begin to get our heads around, around it a little bit. Look at the first part of verse 23 as we just kind of begin to dissect this passage because I want us to I want us to understand this now keep those foundational things in your mind God is holy what does that mean God is sovereign what does that mean God's word will not return void he's going to accomplish his purposes one way or the other nothing will stand in the way of that right think about that and and God God protects his those that he calls he calls them with a purpose and he's going to see that purpose fulfilled okay and, and that's very, very significant here. So look at the first part of verse 23. Here's what, here's what it says. Then he went up from there, from Jericho to Bethel. Um, following the ministry in Jericho, which portrayed a kind of first fruits of the land, Elisha, a man of God, was under direction of God with the, with the word of God. He moves into the land to minister to the people. So Sarah, put that map back up for just a second so we can see this. The kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom of God's people is Israel. And Elijah's already been in all of these places through Israel. He has been in all of these places preaching that there is one God, not many gods, right? There is one God and that God is Jehovah. That's what Elijah's name means. Jehovah is God. And he's been proclaiming that, okay? Now that's interesting. He's gone through all these places and he's trekked all the way down through Israel, look, to Elijah's hill and then he ascends. And there he passes the mantle off to Elisha and Elijah goes back up through the same places and says, oh, and by by the way, that God is salvation. That God saves. He is the hope of Israel. He's the hope of God's people. He's the hope of the nation. That's our message today, right? Our message today is that God is salvation. He is the hope of what ails our nation. He's, he's the hope of the people. That, that's our message today. But it's interesting when you look at Elijah's life because he's backtracking. He is Elijah in reverse, You see that? He's going right back into those same places. Then he went up from there to Bethel. That's the trek that he's taking there. And that's very um, interesting. Now, there were people living in idolatry who badly were in need of the hope of salvation. Okay? Um, Badly in need of the word of God. They needed to hear it. The name Bethel means house of God. That's literally what the name means. If you look at that, uh, Beth, in Hebrew, it means house. El is an abbreviation for Elohim, God. It literally means house of God, and that's very significant. And we know that there was a school of the prophets in Bethel because when Elijah passed through there, the prophets of Israel came out and greeted them. Remember, so there's a school there that we get that. But in spite of all of that, the city has now turned idolatrous and is anything but a center of worship. It's no longer the house of Jehovah God. It's become the house of Baal God. And you go, how do you know that that happens? Well, um, if you go back and you read um, Hosea, the prophet Hosea, um, who was kind of a contemporary of some of the same time, um, Hosea talks about what had happened at Bethel. Ahab and then his son and then Jeroboam, they had set up Baal temples and taken over Bethel, 
which was known to the people of Israel, God's people, as the house of God. And they had essentially said, it is no longer the house of Jehovah God. Now it is the house, the home of Baal, the foreign God. And they removed all the traces of Jehovah God and replaced them with two temples to Baal. And so in, in Hosea, Bethel is called Beth-Avon, which means house of wickedness, house of idolatry. That's interesting, isn't it? Hosea refers to Bethel not as Bethel, but as Beth-Avon. That's significant. That's how we know kind of what's going on there. When Elijah enters into that place, this is a place that is a seedbed for Baal worship. Okay. Now remember when Elijah was living and he confronted the prophets of Baal, he called for all of the prophets to come to Mount Carmel. Remember that? And they met him there and we're going to find out who the true God is. You remember the story, right? And the prophets came from, the prophets of Baal came from all over Israel to Mount Carmel. And there they were destroyed. So God had a prophet, had a school of prophets that Elijah had established at Beth El, but so did Baal. The prophets of Baal had a school there to train new prophets. Why would they need to train new prophets? What happened on Mount Carmel? They were all killed, right? Remember that? So there's new prophets being raised up. That's who these 42 people are. They're prophets of Baal. That's interesting. You go, well, that's not what it says. It says they were young people. We're going to talk about that here in a second. So you understand who they are. Okay. So that's interesting. Why didn't they want Elijah to come? Why were they trying to keep him from coming into Beth Bethel? Huh? And he also didn't want to turn the hearts of, didn't want him to turn the hearts of the people back to God, Jehovah God, Right. Do you see what's happening here? But we read this casually, and, and I'm going to tell you why this has happened. There's some, there's some poor translation of Scripture here. Um, I'm reading from the New King James, and it calls these youths. That's a, not a great translation of the Hebrew word there. The, the King James Version actually calls these children. They're not children. That's a poor translation. It's unfortunate that they've translated that word that way, okay? So we'll get into that more here in just a second um, as we get into it. Um, so that's a little bit of a background. Now, the key here is that Bethel needed the word to show them their sin and bring them back to the Lord. That was their only hope. But here it is, Satan had established a throne there through the false prophets of Baal, okay? Um, Elisha was undoubtedly able to minister to the needs of certain ones there, the remnant, but the city as a whole had never really turned back to the Lord and were still controlled by the prophets of Baal and the worship of this false God. It says this, then he went up from there to Bethel and as he was going up the road, that's where this incident happened. So it's important to understand. That's why I'm giving you this, this history um, of Baal just a little bit. I think there's a message for us in that. Um, we need to always be aware, listen, that the enemy is out to destroy the work of God. It will never happen. But listen, he can take us out sometimes. He can discourage us. Um, tonight, when we're having our prayer time, I kind of just, you know, I, I think in the day that we live in, we feel the heaviness of our times, don't we? We feel the weight of what's going on in our world today. And we don't understand what is that. Well, that's the oppression of the enemy pressing down on us. The truth of the matter is the church and Christians, we have the hope to speak into that gloom, right? But what happens to us? We get weighed down too, right? We get weighed down by that. And, and, and I think that can happen so easily. And so there's some instruction from scripture in light of the unavoidable attacks from the enemy of the world. And we see this over and over again in scripture. And we need to remember this, okay? And I'm gonna give these four things to you really quickly as we move through this, because we see these in scripture. Number one, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, all right? It says this, therefore, let him who thinks he stands Take heed, lest he fall. So number one, we must be alert and take heed lest we fall. It is so easy for us, listen, to get pressed down 
by the things that are happening. The enemy wants to. The second scripture there, Galatians 6, 1 says this, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, your spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. We need to support each other, right? And consider ourselves lest we be tempted or fall into the same traps. We need to, okay? Number three, Ephesians chapter five, verses five and six, it says, see then that you walk circumspectly. What does circumspectly mean? Okay. Cautiously with your eyes open. Be, be, so then that, see that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Isn't it interesting that scripture tells us the days are evil? Um, so here's number three. We must be careful how we're walking. And then fourth, 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We need to be fully aware that we live in an evil world and Satan's on the prowl. Don't ever forget that. When Elijah walked from Jericho to Bethel, the enemy was on the prowl. Okay? So that's Bethel. You see it? Wanted y'all to understand and get your heads around why Bethel is so strategic, why it's so important. Um, can you put the map back up for a second? Let me show them something. One other, one other thing about Bethel. Notice where Bethel is situated. If you, if you look up, you see the name Israel, and you look down and you see the name Judah, that's the southern kingdom. Where is Bethel? Right in the middle. You see it? House of God. Right in the middle. Okay? And it's a strategic place. And don't you know that the enemy knew that was a strategic place? All right, so that's significant. Next, we've looked at Bethel. Let's talk about the bad boys, okay? I kept thinking of that song, you know, that was on the cop show. Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? <laughs> what you gonna do when they come for you? <laughs> I kept thinking of that. Um, so that's a significant part of the story, these bad boys of Bethel. And, and Elisha kind of encounters them. So let's kind of go back to verse 23 and look at it. Verse 23, we kind of get to see him. Here's what it says. Then he went up from there to Bethel. And as he was going up the road, some youths, that's the way the new King James says it. Some youths came out from the city and mocked him and said to him, go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head. Um, now we're calling these bad boys, okay? But who were they really? Um, it's very interesting and it might help us get around this incident a little bit. Um, different translations here. What does it call these youths? What's different? If you have something different, I said the King James uses, calls them children, right? The new King James calls them youths. What other, what other words do you have there? Anybody have something different? NIV, anybody have NIV? NIV is youth. youth, okay. Anything, anybody else have something different? ESV, anybody have ESV? Group of boys, Group of boys. okay. This is very interesting. It's the, the word there that's translated as youth or children is the word na'ar in Hebrew, N-A-A-R. It's very significant. Um, this is the word that was used for Isaac when he was almost 30 years old. These are not children and they're not young men. They are meant an older son, an older child. So um, I would call Trey my boy, right? He's my boy. He's my, he's my son. But Trey's almost 30 years old, right? So um, do you, you see what I'm saying? So, so we have a real hard time understanding sometimes these Hebrew words. And I think translation becomes a real important thing here. Um, Naar is used of both Samuel when he was a young boy ministering in the temple in front of Eli. It's also the word that's used for David when he fights Goliath. Now, context dictates sometimes what they're saying, and they weren't making a commentary on the age of either David or Samuel. They were making an, a statement about their stature, that they were small in size, not age. Naar has to do a lot of times not with age, but stature. And some commentaries will tell you that rather than making a statement about their age as a youth or as a child, they're making a statement about their moral stature and fiber. Um, and I'll get more into that here in just a second as they talk about it. Um, it's also used to refer to morality, 
or wickedness, poor stature, immaturity, um, to where you act out on certain things. And it may point to a person who is rebellious, riotous, or causes violence in the streets. Isn't that interesting? This word naar, that's an interesting phrase. Dr. John MacArthur said, these were not children, but infidels and idolatrous young men who were prophets of Baal in training. Isn't that interesting? So that's significant, okay? Uh, the term naar was sometimes used for servants or soldiers. Um, now, all of this just to say that it's difficult at best um, to kind of calculate what age these were. Generally, naar referred to a young person that was between the ages of 25 and 30. So what you have here is a marauding band of prophets of Baal in training who are trying to stop Elijah from getting into the town of Baal to preach the word of God. That's the picture you need to see. That's literally what's happening here. Okay. Um, so the debate, of course, arises on who's correct or who's not. Most commentaries will say that the King James translation of this as children is an unfortunate translation. That's an interesting way of saying they think they missed it, the, the true meaning of this, and getting at what's really going here. And you have to dig just a little bit deeper. Once again, remember that God's, that, I'm sorry, that God's man, Elijah, had destroyed the 450 prophets of Baal that came from all over the northern kingdom of Israel. There were no prophets of Baal left. So where, where is the Baal worship continuing? Well, young people in their homes who had been taught to worship Baal are now in training to replace them. And that's who these men likely were. They went up to Bethel and there going ahead of them were those who mocked. And I got to stop there. Our time's up. If y'all will let me, we'll come back to this one. I know it's just a short one. It's going to throw us off a little bit, but there's some really good stuff in here still that we need to cover um, because I want you to see about um, not just a little bit more about these bad boys of Bethel, uh, but I want us to understand why what happened happened and get our heads around it because it's one of those stories to me that a lot of times causes people to go, well, I don't want to serve a God like that. That's that wrathful, that vengeful. You know, that would kill a bunch of kids. Well, now we know they're not kids, right? Probably about 30-year-old men, okay, um, who was trying to stop the prophet of, of Elisha. And um, we, don't know, we don't know what harm was going to come to him. But um, there's, there's more to this. So I'll come back to this next week if you guys don't mind, and we'll finish up with it. I just think it's so interesting when you start digging into this. And remember the foundation, guys. Remember the holiness of God. God's ways are not going to be thwarted. They're not going to, he is sovereign God and his word doesn't return void. He's going to accomplish his purposes. Okay. Um, so read it. You're going to come back with more questions. I know uh, you go back and read it a couple of times and you'll go, I don't like this story, you know, because it is a tough one. And there's lots of questions that can come up when you start reading a passage like this. But I don't, I don't think we ought to shy away from it. I think we ought to get to the heart of what God's teaching us and showing us through his word. Okay, we'll stop there for tonight and I'll come back next week. All right. Comments, observations, questions. Did you even know this story was there? Yeah, I remember one day I came into the church office and Deborah and I always had these little Bible discussions in the morning and she was telling me about something she'd read that she'd never read before in the Bible that just fascinated her. And I said, well, have you ever read the story of Elisha and the bears that came out and killed all the young people? And she said, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> I said, yes, it is. And I took her Bible and showed her and she went, I've never seen that before. <laughs> so there's a lot of people that don't know this story, uh, which makes it to me even more interesting. And then you read it and you go, what a horrible story. <laughs> you know? So it's an interesting one. Maybe you're kind of starting to kind of get your head around a little bit of what's happening there just based on uh, kind of some of what we've shown tonight. So you start to understand the significance of it. The big thing to me is how does it apply to us? How does it apply? And I want to get to that part. So we'll look at that some more next week. Let me read it, lead us in a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed this evening. Father, thank you for uh, the study of your word. Thank you for opportunities for us to dig into it. And God, I always find that when we come to your word and we're seeking you in it, God, you can show us things that we've never seen before. God, about ourselves, 
God, about you and who you are and how you work. God, about how, Lord, we don't have to be filled with fear or doubt, worry in this day. We don't have to let the things of this world get to us, that we are serving the living God who created everything out of nothing. And God, your ways will move forward. And God, I pray that we would be willing to be used of you just like Elijah was, to bring hope to a hurting world, to preach about and teach about and share about your salvation and your wonderful grace. God, I pray you would give us the courage to do that, Father, even through this story. God, to see that we don't have to fear what the world or the enemy throws at us. God, that you are bigger than, greater than, in control. We thank you for that. God, help us to leave this place tonight in that victory. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen. Thank you guys uh, for putting up with me.